this morning. So I think a lot of you were probably there listening to Ryan Sharp from Hoboken um, this morning. And, and we heard a really great story about what they've been able to do in a relatively short amount of time with some, um, some good policy tools. Tigard has a similar story. I think we are probably roughly where Hoboken was in 2010. Uh, in 2023 right now, so we're a little bit behind, but we're making good progress with our complete streets policy. So just reflecting back on that, um, in, a, in a break here, I wanted to uh, share some stats with you. So, um, and this is to point out some of the differences between Hoboken and Tiger. They're roughly the same size in terms of population. Um, so Hoboken is like 58, 60,000 people. Tiger is 55,000. But the differences here, which are important, I think, as to tell part of the story, is that uh, the land area of Hoboken is only 1.97 square miles. The land area of the city of Tigard is 12.76 miles. So roughly the same population, but totally different uh, urban built environment, right? Um, so population density of Hoboken, uh, depending on the census year, it's either the third or fourth densest city, over 50,000 people in the United States. Uh, 48,000 people per square mile. Tiger, 4,200 <laughs> people per square mile. So we are implementing some similar tools and taking a similar approach, but we have, I, I, would, I would argue, some bigger challenges that are not totally unique to Tiger. They're unique. They're, they're, they're not unique to a lot of cities, especially on the West Coast, um, that, have, uh, um, that are urbanizing a little slower uh, and more recently. So anyway, uh, going right into it, uh, first slide here. So uh, what's the problem in Tiger? Well, it's not yet the walkable, bikeable, and transit accessible community that's envisioned in our strategic plan. So Tiger adopted a strategic plan, which we get uh, poked fun at a lot uh, about our original strategic plan which was adopted in 2015. We want it to be the most walkable community in the Pacific Northwest. It's a lofty goal. Uh, it's a great thing to work towards. Um, and, and we've made progress. We have since adopted a new or updated strategic vision, which broadens the, the objective a little bit. And uh, now we're seeking to be an equitable community that is walkable, healthy, and accessible for everyone. Um, but you know, still in Tiger, uh, getting around without a car is really hard um, for, for most people. And it could be potentially dangerous uh, if you're trying to travel on foot or bike uh, along some of our larger arterial roads. But the, the big uh, arterials and highways that run through Tigard. Anyhow, though, we, we do have a strong foundation to support change, and we are working towards that. So we have a great uh, off-street path network. Uh, I know some of the people in the audience are familiar with that. We have the Fano Creek Regional Trail running through the city and some of our neighboring cities. Um, it not only provides recreational opportunities, but it's an important transportation corridor. And um, as the trail network expands and we continue to develop, um, the system is going to provide more and more viable transportation options for our community uh, members. We have a robust Safe Routes to School program. Um, it's effective in encouraging kids to walk and bike. And over the last uh, four years, we've been quite successful in um, getting infrastructure dollars through the Oregon Department of uh, Transportation to implement some of our capital improvements around uh, schools in Tigard. So we're super excited about that. Um, we adopted an ADA transition plan a few years ago, and we have um, combined some of the, the curb ramp upgrades into our pavement preservation program, and so we're implementing those across the city every year. We have a Ped Bike Small Projects Fund. Um, with our Transportation Capital Improvement Program, we allocate right now $300,000 a year to do Ped and Bike Small Projects. A lot of those are related to school access needs, uh, pedestrian crossings, and we're thinking about um, expanding this out and, and hopefully adding more budget to it to include a new traffic calming uh, program for the city. 
And then uh, in terms of development, we are we're gr a growing city, obviously. We are uh, targeting a lot of that growth in some of our town and regional centers. So um, downtown Tigard and the Tigard Triangle are two urbanizing areas uh, within uh, Tigard. And we also have the Washington Square Regional Center, which is another urbanizing area. And we've, we've been doing some plan updates for those areas to make them denser, more walkable, uh, bikeable, and transit friendly. And then we also are growing on the western edge of our city, which is the, the edge of the regional urban growth boundary. Um, some interesting things happening right there, uh, right now, with that in terms of thinking about, rather than an expansion of the overall UGB, doing a land swap. And so Metro Regional Government is, is very involved in that right now. Um, and we like to think that we're doing great things. Even though it's on the, urb on the edge, uh, we're doing good things to try to make transit supportive um, development out there. Uh, the problem continued. Um, you know, our, our pattern of development just has not provided for uh, non-auto modes as the city developed, and it was, those are, they're kind of forgotten. Um, so we've urbanized quickly, and the transportation system and infrastructure has not kept up. So you know, our sidewalk network is incomplete. We got too many of these all over the city. Uh, many busy roads fail to accommodate peds and bikes. Um, this road, fortunately, is being upgraded now with bike lanes and sidewalks. Um, it's difficult to walk along congested and wide multi-lane roadways. It's difficult to walk across them, and we got a few of these big multi-lane roads. Uh, and you know. On a serious note, these, this is where we're seeing our, our fatalities and serious injuries, and this is something we have to address um, going forward. Our bike network is not robust enough to support cycling as a viable transportation option. Uh, same thing with our pedestrian network in terms of incomplete sidewalks. So, um, beyond the strategic vision for the city, we needed a, a solution. We needed a framework to support um, the right kinds of decisions going forward. And this is where it, I think it ties back into Hoboken's story. You need some uh, sort of organizing principle or, or something, a vehicle to help you make, and not just you, but the, the city as an organization or whatever agency you're working uh, with or for, to make the right kinds of decisions that will have impacts, you know, one, five, ten years down the road uh, as you're, you're doing this work. So. Uh, for us, the solution was to develop a complete streets policy and implementation plan. And I have a little asterisk next to the solution here because, again, this, this can help us with making the right kinds of transportation and mobility decisions, but it's not uh, di directly impacting our built form or environment. It, it, it can help, but it's a little bit disconnected. Um, and, and that's such a big thing that we're trying to solve for is how do we develop so that you have destinations that are, that are walkable and bikeable and, and transit accessible. Um, so we, we started down this path of, of coming up with a complete streets policy. This is not um, groundbreaking stuff here. Um, agencies have been developing complete streets policies for years now. You can go to um, Smart Growth uh, USA and, and find a map of all the complete streets policies across the country. I think last I checked there was like 14 or 1500 of them. Um, the approach that we took was a little bit different in terms of we developed a, a policy but we also linked uh, a strategic implementation plan uh, to that policy. So it took us about six months to uh, develop the policy and we initiated in the fall of 2018. We brought on a consultant, largely to help with facilitation, because at the time, there were definitely some divergent views within the organization, and that, that consultant helped facilitate some of these challenging conversations within the organization. Um, we had an internal work group. We had uh, pretty good involvement with some of our agency partners. Um, we have a transportation advisory committee made up of uh, community members. We also engage with our city council and the broader public uh, along the way. And ultimately, we adopted, or the city adopted the policy in June of 2019. Um, let's see here. So um, 
really what it comes down to is uh, having this vision statement for what we want. We, we asked the question, like, what do we want the city to be like in 15 or 20 years? Um, and really it came down to having a transportation system that serves all users equitably. Um, the policy elements, these are sort of bo boilerplate policy elements that you would find in a complete streets policy if you follow the, sort of the national approach. Um, and then the addition here is the implementation plan. So um, we wanted to do a scan of, of how the city was operating right now and figure out where some of those deficiencies or problem areas were and uh, address those head on. So these are things, I think I get into them in the, the next slide here. I'll, I'll go next. Um, well, let me just pause here and just say some of these things really go back to what Ryan was talking about this morning in terms of um, making sure that your, uh, your pavement management program is taking into consideration the, the infrastructure needs. And it doesn't always have to be really expensive fixes. It can be uh, fixes with paint or tough curb and wands, you know, those, those sorts of things that become routine in the annual pavement um, management program. And the, oftentimes those things are overlooked, but they're, they're very inexpensive and, and easy to implement if you have good direction and policy in place to support that. Um, so your annual pavement management program, your development code. In Tigard, our development code uh, specifies what our roadway cross sections look like. And so we have some specific um, guidance on how we're not there yet, but when we do get into update our development code to update our street cross sections so that they are um, meeting the needs of all users. And then finally, another one to hit on is just your engineering design standards. Um, we have uh, a lot of our standard drawings in our engineering design standards, and those need to be uh, meeting our complete streets objectives. So those are three I just want to throw out as, as examples. So um, now that we've had this policy and, and plan in place for a few years, um, I wanted to share some of the results that we've seen. So um, we've strengthened our Safe Routes to School program. Um, we have made, as I mentioned, improvements uh, integrated into the payment management program. That's just huge to be able to have that as a, just a basic thing that you do every year when you're doing your planning. Um, we, but, Prior to having the policy in place, we actually had, oh, <laughs> thank you for helping me out. Um, prior to having the policy and plan in place, we actually had two separate advisory committees. We had a transportation advisory committee and a ped bike advisory committee. And one of the implementation actions from this policy was to combine, combine those into a single committee. We don't want to be having these conversations with two separate <laughs> groups. We need to have these conversations with one group and make decisions together so you're not um, alienating people or leaving people out of important conversations. So that was one of the important things we did. Um, let's see. Oh, I'll pause for a moment here. You got it? Showing up again or something. Oh, yeah. Yay! <laughs> um, oh yeah, I'll, I'll hold that a little closer. Better? Okay. Um, so the next one on the list is our transportation system plan. It was really important for us to get the complete streets policy adopted before we went into the next update of our transportation system plan. Um, the complete streets policy was really foundational for both the, the goals and the policies of our TSP. And I would advise any, any agency who's embarking on an update of their TSP to make sure that they have some of these conversations before they get into the TSP. Um, think about how, you know, what are your modal priorities? Um, or uh, what are your modal prioritization, I guess? I, that's one thing that we were not able to accomplish with our Complete Streets um, policy at the time. I think if we went back and revisited it now, we'd have no problem putting pedestrians uh, on top. And, and that's something I think that's really, really important. Anyway, we adopted our TSP in January of 22. We've been able to 
uh, reduce posted speeds across the city. We've dropped uh, posted speeds on all of our neighborhood streets from 25 to 20 miles an hour. Plus, we've um, we identified, I think, 13 roads, uh, collectors and arterials in Tigard, where we've uh, at, uh, requested speed reductions through ODOT, where we didn't have the ability to do it in-house, and we're making progress on all those. So these are things that will have a big impact on safety for the community, and the complete streets policy really helped facilitate that. Um, we've also, with our TSP, we changed three planned five-lane uh, road cross-sections in Tigard and, and kept them at three-lane uh, road cross-sections. This is one of the most important things we can do for uh, pedestrian and bike safety is not to have these five-lane arterials. And um, so that was a big deal for Tigard. We also um, created new robust pedibike network plans that we're uh, working on implementing um, across the city. Um, and then finally, there's been a shift in mindset. I think one of the things I want to hit on here is, is getting a policy in place like this. Um, just as by way of example, um, this was not the easiest thing to pull off in Tigard <laughs> at the time. But I think like a lot of agencies over the last few years, you've seen a lot of turnover. Um, we've established this policy as the new norm uh, for how we operate in the city of Tigard. We have a lot of new people coming on board. and um, we've established new norms for the city through this policy. And it's been really cool to see how that um, has impacted our work now that we have sort of a whole new group of people uh, working at the city. Um, we included some... Um, I would say Tigard is sort of known as a car city. Um, you get around by car and... Um, I think there was a, there was a, well, I don't think, there was a mindset kind of uh, internally when I started the city about five years ago that that's how we, that's how we did things and, um, and that is, that's a uh, change. So it wasn't, it wasn't easy. Like I said, we actually have lost a number of staff over the last few years who didn't totally agree with the complete streets policy. Um, and, you know, we're, we're moving forward now though. Um, <laughs> So uh, we included a few uh, images just of these are the types of projects that you can get built really quickly and easily if you have this kind of thing established for your payment management um, program. So these are striping changes that we've implemented that have allowed us to put in new uh, bike facilities or, or pedestrian uh, walkways uh, short of doing new sidewalks across the city. Um, also, uh, some, uh, some new crossing improvements as well that this policy has supported. So a new pedestrian hybrid here next to our high school, a uh, new walkway where we couldn't afford to put in a sidewalk, but we were able to put in tough curb and wands to provide some separation for people. And this connects to a, a new uh, trail in Tigard. Uh, new crossing of Fanner Creek Trail and a, a roadway near a, an L, a middle school in Tigard. And then finally, work underway. So um, one of the implementation activities in the plan was to uh, develop a Vision Zero policy for the city. And um, so we're taking that on now. We, we applied in partnership with Metro, Washington County, and Multnomah County for Federal Highway Administration, Safe Streets for All funding to develop a Vision Zero plan for the city. Fortunately, we, are, we were awarded the funding and now we're moving forward with that. Again, going back to the, the plenary this morning, complete streets policy, vision zero. These are the types of tools that you need in place to support this work. Um, we're doing, well, Courtney's leading uh, work on a, a pedestrian crossing needs inventory across the city. Having the inventory in place will help us start to tick those off um, as we do uh, other roadway projects or allow us to go after additional grant funding. Um, I mentioned our city development code. We have a, um, some recommendations that are ready to go as soon as we do that update. Uh, I mentioned neighborhood traffic calming. We'd like to bring that program back. We haven't done traffic calming for a number of years. In fact, prior to my arrival, we were taking speed humps out, which is like crazy, but uh, we stopped doing that. Um, let's see, and then I talked mostly about little things that we're doing, but it's also supporting some of the, the bigger things that we want to do. So we have a number of big roadway projects. Um, Hall Boulevard, which is owned by ODOT. Um, it's an arterial road in Tigard. 
we ha we're working on a community visioning process right now that will include things like new setback sidewalks, protected bike lanes, those sorts of things, getting us ready to take over jurisdictional ownership of the road from ODOT. Um, Greenberg Road, this is another, this is owned by, the section of Greenberg Road is owned by Washington County, similar. We came up with a, a proposed uh, corridor plan with protected bike lanes, sidewalks, and we're in the process of um, finding funding for that project. Um, Southwest 72nd Avenue, we just applied for a federal raise grant to do this project, and this, the image on the screen is just one intersection with, you know, protected intersection, uh, protected bike lanes on that project. Um, regional trails, we work closely with our partners uh, at Metro, for example, on uh, pursuing funding opportunities to, uh, to expand and improve our, our regional trail network. And then finally, uh, it's worth noting that Tigard is really, uh, we were bisected by highways, freeways, and, and rail lines, and they really limit our connectivity. So our new TSP suggests a number of projects to um, open up some of these connections with new pedestrian and bicycle bridges and under, rail undercrossings, and we're already going after grant funding to support that work. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop and hand it over to Ryan and Kate. Do we know if it's on the Zoom? Okay, sweet. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Ryan Farncombe. I'm a senior consultant with Parametrics which is a very generic job title, senior consultant, but I do the transportation planning. Um, I'm also a little bit hoarse today, so apologies. Uh, spent a lot of last night shouting on a bike ride and at a bar after the conference. Um, but I've been working on this great project with Kate Drennan at the city of Vancouver, and very excited to talk with you about it today. Great, thank you. So as Ryan said, I'm Kate Drennan. I'm the principal transportation planner at the city of Vancouver, and we're here today to talk about Fourth Plain Boulevard. Um, this was a project that started back in 2019, and um, let me lean on just great. Um, we'll have a map here in a second, but it's a five-lane arterial and a wonderfully diverse part of our city um, that was suffering from some of the highest crash rates in the city and was really long overdue for a makeover. Next slide. So similar to Tigard, we were a little bit late to the game, but the city of Vancouver adopted a complete streets policy in 2017, and it would have been ideal if it had coincided with our TSP, but that is happening now. Um, but it's really given us as staff the policy backbone to support a true look at retrofitting and repurposing roads in the city of Vancouver. And when we passed our policy, we did kind of a five-part charter. Um, so for all of our complete streets projects, we start with data collection, what's happening on the road now, we do the project, which is what we're going to talk about today, that process. Um, we implement, usually through paving, as one part, but then maybe through some other mechanisms. And then we spend a full year collecting data um, across every season, every quarter, to see how the roadway is operating. And this is part of our sort of agreement with the community, that we're going to go in, we're going to assess, we're going to see how things are going. If it all goes off the rails, then we'll revisit it. Or maybe we'll see places that we can improve uh, the complete streets uh, implementation that we did. So we collect for a full year, and then we report back to our city council, to our Transportation Mobility Commission, and uh, look at how the performance is. And we actually presented our first full year evaluation to our city council last night. Um, and I think it went pretty well. And some councilors were like, we didn't go far enough. And others you know, were like, uh, what does the data say? Let's keep looking at it. But it's part of building that trust with the community. And we'll kind of get to that, that when we say, hey, we think this is going to work, uh, they'll believe us, and they'll know that we will follow through to actually track whether it's achieving our outcomes. Next slide. So for those less familiar with Vancouver, we are north, north of the river. Um, the project that we're talking about today is Fourth Plain Boulevard, as well as Fourth Vancouver Way. It's, um, if you think about, probably most of you don't think about the whole like city of Vancouver, but we're about a third of the way up through the city. Uh, we're just <laughs> east of I-5. Um, for some context, Fort Vancouver Way here is home to Clark College. There's the VA. There's a whole bunch of parks. So there's just a ton of um, 
destinations on this corridor. And then Fort, Fourth Plain goes from F Street all the way to Andreessen. I mean, it goes further, but this was our project area. And it was such um, a big set of dual corridors that we broke it into two phases. And again, we coincided these complete streets projects with our paving projects, so we knew we were going to be, you know, looking at the street, we're going to be resurfacing, what can we do? And so this first green set is set to be repaved in 2023 this year, and then the second one is 2024. Okay, so fourth plane today. Um, oh, I skipped ahead. So it's, we, I sort of think about, um, Fourth Plains is a little bit like 122nd Avenue here in Portland in that it's five lanes, it carries you know, a fair amount of traffic. Um, it's a really diverse corridor. It's probably like the most diversity in the city of Vancouver. Um, what's different, there's also, I should say, a lot of safety issues <laughs> similar to 122nd where it's one of our highest crash corridors in our city. Um, but there's unlike, well not unlike 122nd, but rather than being sort of like big box retail, it, there's a lot of small um, community businesses in this corridor uh, that are really locally serving. So, and there's also service providers. So it's like this corridor is, is highly embedded in the community. And there's also been a lot of planning work on this corridor. So there's a, a pretty well set of, um, well established set of like neighbors and community members and activists and everyone that really care about this corridor. So it's like the corridor has an audience and like sort of has champions within the community, which was really important um, for this project. Okay, so let's take a look at this, this ugly, ugly corridor. Um, so this is what it looks like today. It's five lanes. There are some bike lanes, um, but they're pretty disconnected. And speeding was, a, usually you see cyclists riding on the, the sidewalk. Um, and then speeding was a huge concern. And it showed up not only our data, but like that is what we heard from the community over and over and over again, was just about the speeding. So, um, as you can see, it's really wide, it's straight, it's unimpeded, it's no surprise that that would lead to speeding. Um, it's also part of kind of an international district, like I said, really diverse community. And one thing that we also heard was that it's, you know, it's a special place in Vancouver and it should be, people should realize that when they kind of get to that corridor that it's like, hey, let's stop, let's slow down, let's stay a while, let's visit these markets. Like there's all this cool stuff happening, uh, but you wouldn't necessarily know it when you look at the roadway today. Um, another big component of this project is that we have the vine on this corridor. And if you don't know, this is actually the first bus rapid transit project in the region, was in the city of Vancouver. <laughs> uh, yay, we're very proud of it. Um, it's a great service, it does really well, and honestly, this corridor is highly transit dependent, so a lot of people use the Vine. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we not only sort of increased access to the Vine, made it more attractive, but that we didn't do anything that would degrade uh, the quality of the transit travel time and all of that um, on this corridor. Thank you, Kate. So continuing our tour of existing conditions so you get the full story from when we start talking about our lessons learned. Um, the existing conditions out there, generally it's a five lane cross section. Um, sometimes it necks down to four lanes, but there's generally a center turn lane through much of the corridor. There are existing sidewalks on both sides of the road. There are a lot of business accesses and streets uh, on this corridor. So there are a lot of driveways for pedestrians to traverse. But this is kind of a good generic snapshot of what the corridor looks like today. Um, you know, as Kate mentioned, um, safety is a huge driver of this project, safety for all users. Here's just some kind of high-level summary statistics about safety uh, from 2018 to 2020 in terms of the, the number of crashes, hundreds of crashes, a lot of bike ped crashes. Uh, this corridor is one of the top um, safety concerns in the entire city when the city had conducted a citywide safety analysis. Um, so there's a lot of there's it's multifaceted safety issues we're trying to address here. And so if you'll take a brief trip with me down traffic analysis lane, um, I won't go into great detail, but um, traffic analysis and traffic mobility is an important part of this story on Fourth Plain. I think as many of you know, um, most jurisdictions in Washington and Oregon as well have uh, codified uh, measures for traffic mobility on uh, their corridors that um, basically guide uh, the level of acceptable traffic delay uh, within a given corridor. And uh, Vancouver has these as well. They actually measure their traffic mobility based on how long it takes one to get from a particular 
end-to-end uh, -end segment in a corridor. So the standard we are actually adhered to for this corridor is 10 miles per hour in the evening peak, which is actually pretty generous in terms of allowing, frankly, quite a bit of congestion um, before we're breaching that standard. The, our analysis showed that the existing corridor was actually performing pretty well. Uh, the average speed is not too far from uh, 25 miles per hour. Uh, I should also say this is the average speed. There is a lot of speeding. Um, I think when we did some speed analysis, there was um, more than zero cars going over 70 miles an hour on some sections of this corridor. Um, then we did a couple of, um, we ran our, the, 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 the tools, and we did a couple of analyses to understand, well, what would happen to traffic mobility if we removed a lane in this corridor? And that's what that middle column shows there. And as you can see, um, you know, which kind of makes sense, if you remove a lane from this corridor, a travel lane in each direction, uh, the corridor does get more congested, but it's still actually um, beating the mobility standard of 10 miles per hour. We, we found it to be about 16 miles per hour. However, our, our stakeholders and our internal stakeholders at the city, um, we were not totally comfortable with this decrease in traffic mobility. Um, the concern was mainly that there's a lot of development coming in on the corridor and that we would be pushing the corridor towards failing the city's codified mobility standard. So the, the discussion around what the mobility standard is and trying to meet it is a discussion for another day. The, the standard was in the code and we didn't have flexibility to revisit that during this project. So we tried a couple of other things and we did a truncated road diet where we actually ended the, uh, we modified the road diet slightly in the east end of the corridor where we knew the traffic was heaviest. And doing that substantially brought uh, traffic levels back up to something that was acceptable um, with uh, all of our internal stakeholders. So that is one of the key assumptions that we move forward with as part of this project. Ryan, what's the Average daily trips. Thank you, Jenna. No, sorry, did you say what the number was? I mean, oh. <laughs> <laughs> So the average daily, um, so on the west end of the corridor, I believe it's between 15 and 18,000. As you get further east, it's, it's above 20,000, closer to Andreessen. Okay, thank you. And Ryan's sort of previewing that our eventual solutions are not the same across the entire corridor. And I will say, um, Concurrency is something, now that we're doing our TSP, that the city is revisiting and looking at more ways to evaluate the performance of our roadway beyond just uh, traffic mobility or vehicle mobility. So excited for that to happen and change those, those rules. Um, so what were the tools that were available for this project? Well, as I said, we use our paving program as an opportunity to take a closer look um, at every road. So we have a list every year the, um, of what's getting paved. It goes out about three years. and our public works and our planning team sit down together and we look at every single roadway to see if we could do something to improve um, our, our, walk, our walking and biking environments. Um, and when it comes to a major arterial or maybe a major bike corridor where we want to repurpose a travel lane or remove parking, then we have a process for this, like our complete streets process. So that's, that's where this came out of was, okay, it's repaving, this is our opportunity. Um, what can we do? but what can we do with our paving? So that means it's curb to curb. So what can we do in those sort of constraints? So now we're getting into the, the juicy uh, issues <laughs> and trade-offs. So like I said, the, the real purpose of the project was to really improve safety on this corridor by slowing down traffic and calming the corridor. Um, we really wanted to enhance the comfort and safety of pedestrians and bicyclists and create more continuity with our bike lanes. Um, we also wanted to preserve our transit travel times. We wanted to keep that service competitive um, and not kind of slow down our BRT. So those were, those were the goals, but then with them came some trade-offs. Yeah, so this project, again, about improving safety and comfort for uh, people uh, riding a bike, walking, using transit in the corridor, but also driving because it was, it's unsafe for all users. So, the, there, were, there were multiple issues and trade-offs we had to reckon with, again, working within to the existing curb-to-curb -curb pavement. You know, there's only so much pavement to go around. First, again, meeting those traffic mobility standards. That was a baseline thing we had to do no matter what we did to the roadway. Um, the second point that, that Kate mentioned was, um, at a minimum, preserving the bus rapid transit's um, speed and reliability in the corridor. Um, the last thing we wanted to do was implement a 
lane reconfiguration that while it narrowed, uh, reduced the number of travel lanes and calmed traffic, also slowed the busway down. That is not what we wanted to do. Moreover, in talking with our, our uh, partners at, at CTRAN, um, the, the Vine project had a significant federal investment associated with it and a long agreement, um, a long-term agreement to um, maintain the mobility of that bus, which essentially meant the bus had to keep uh, stopping in lane so that it didn't have to pull back into traffic and uh, wait for cars to yield to it. So this created another constraint on our corridor that we needed to manage to achieve our, our goals. Um, and then the last one, which um, we'll talk about how this played out, again, scarce roadway space. There's obviously needs for transit, there's needs for people walking, there's needs for people cycling. How do we divvy up this roadway space um, to essentially favor one user or, or another or solve uh, one problem or another in a different way? So when I started this project a couple years ago, I naively thought, you know, it's a five-lane, four-lane cross-section. Let's take a lane away, put a center turn lane and some bike lanes, a buffer, bada bing, bada boom. You got yourself a lane reconfiguration and a complete street. However, all these things we just talked about made that a lot more complicated. So um, we came up with several different approaches um, that became the basis for discussing with the community what we wanted to do with this corridor. And so these are just kind of generic approaches to um, reallocating lane space. The first was more of a um, mobility lane or cyclist focus, where we would take that, um, essentially that freed up space from that extra lane and allocate it more towards cycling and buffering it to the maximum extent possible to make it a more comfortable facility. I swear that text was in that box earlier. <laughs> um, another approach was, uh, was again, going back to the importance of the BRT in the corridor, um, we looked at a variety of options of providing um, transit priority lanes in the corridor. For example, business access in transit lanes, which are lanes that are open to transit vehicles and right-turning cars who are to access businesses. Um, the trade-off associated with that, of course, is if we dedicate lane space to buses, there is less space to buffer that bike lane. So the, the trade-off here is that we had um, essentially less of a buffer for the bike facility if we emphasized uh, this transit solution. And then finally, this is really specific to the east end of the corridor where the road necks down to four lanes and we're extremely space constrained. Um, the other problem with this east end of the corridor is that it was the most heavily trafficked section of the corridor and where we had the most need to provide priority to the bus to make sure it didn't get stuck in traffic. So the, the options were, we felt kind of, frankly, stuck between a rock and a hard place. It was difficult to talk about implementing a buffered bike lane, uh, given we needed to maintain those two westbound traffic lanes to meet mobility standards, and also provide uh, priority for the bus. So this became a major point of discussion with uh, the council and the uh, city's mobility commission about how we could remedy this, uh, essentially, bike gap at the very east end of the corridor. So um, we did conduct a whole heck of a lot of outreach as part of this project, which I'm going to compress into about 12 seconds. But uh, it involved uh, online and in-person um, uh, in engagement. Uh, importantly, we actually went out in the corridor multiple times, knocking on doors, talking to businesses about the project. This project came after the Vine, multiple years after the Vine, where um, there was a prior conversation with the community about potentially removing a travel lane, uh, and it was resoundingly rejected by the community. So we knew we had to come in and talk about this project again and explain the benefits and how it aligns with community values. But what we heard uh, in summary is when we talked to residents, there was a strong, a, there was strong support for repurposing lane space for something else, kind of evenly split, split between um, bus or bike. But when we talked to businesses, there was more of an emphasis on providing uh, speed and reliability for bus since actually many employees reached the businesses in the corridor um, by bus, and they felt that a lot of their customers also accessed um, their business by bus. Yeah, and I just want to remark that, I mean, I've been doing this a while, not that long, but a while, and the fact that we were taking a lane of traffic in each direction, and if you saw those numbers, the people who were like, no, leave the lane of traffic, it was 12% for residents, 
um, or 12% for businesses and 17% for residents. I've never seen more support for taking travel lanes, ever. Like, even close. I mean, it was, that's incredible. Um, so it really, people recognize that like something had to be done. Um, so our final outcomes, where did we land? So this uh, first section is actually on Fort Vancouver Way. So this is what's gonna be happening this year. And we got some really cool stuff out of this. Um, this first piece is further uh, west from that part that Ryan was just talking about, but it's the phase one on 4th Plain, we're putting in a two-way cycle track on 4th Plain Boulevard over an I-5 bridge deck, which is new. Uh, you know, the, the city of Vancouver's never done a cycle track, let alone a two-way cycle track. I don't think Wash Dots put a cycle track on their facilities on a bridge deck before. So this took a lot of negotiation with Wash Dot. I mean, we're putting in bike signals for the first time. It's a lot of big changes for our uh, public works team. But we've been, we've been bringing them along. And the big get for this is that by moving uh, the bikes over to this two-way cycle track, we're avoiding some on and off ramps onto I-5. So we're significantly increasing the safety. And it's also making a much better situation for people that are walking on that bridge deck because now they have all this extra space where they're separated from cars. Um, this next image is down on Fort Vancouver Way. And on this roadway, we were able to repurpose a travel lane in each direction and then also take parking off that corridor to create this transit priority and buffered bike lanes. And we did that um, in coordination with both the VA and Clark College, who um, were really supportive. Again, a lot of folks uh, access those facilities by bike. And again, incredibly, when we brought up parking removal, they were like, yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I do think partly it's the post-COVID world where, you know, there's a lot more hybrid happening at Clark College. Um, so, so they don't have as much parking demand, but they, you know, we did a lot of work doing parking studies showing that it was fine. There was plenty of parking availability and we managed to bring them along, which was great. So phase two, the more complicated we ended up finding something kind of in the middle of those two images that Ryan showed you. So we were able to fit these, so we call them mobility lanes. This is sort of a, an interesting thing. In the city of Vancouver, we don't call them bike lanes. We call them mobility lanes, small mobility lanes. So that means people on bicycles, on e-bikes, on e-scooters. If you have a better term that we should use, <laughs> please let me know. I don't really like it, but that's where we're at right now. So mobility lanes, AKA bike lanes, um, we're able to put them in continuously um, and mostly with a buffer all the way up until about uh, Northeast 62nd. So we got that on the whole corridor and then we were able to add the bus access and transit lanes, basically where we needed them to access those vine stops so that the vine didn't have to pull over out of traffic. If you ever really wanna get into all the design rabbit holes we went down to try to make this work. You should take Ryan or Adriana Stanley or myself out for a beer and we've got some stories. But we were able to get those bat lanes uh, serving the vine so that the vine now has priority, they're able to stop and lane, they meet all their standards, it's great. But we still get that continuous buffer bike lane. But we kind of realized that we needed to do more. So we also, during this project, started talking about all the different bike connections through this area, so north-south um, connections, further east-west connections. What if people don't want to be on East Plain? And so as part of this project, we did kind of a three-tiered approach. We said, what can we do with the paving? And that's those mobility lanes and the bus access and transit lanes. What can we do through our trans transportation improvement program? So future repaving projects or sidewalk info, or we do have a neighborhood traffic calming program that we use. And so we, we identified all of these complementary projects that we could add um, to our tip and to those projects to complement this. So we have uh, restriping. We're taking a center turn lane to add a buffered mobility lane on Northeast Stapleton. We're not even going to do a big process. We're just going to do it um, because the data shows we can. We're gonna improve our existing bike lanes on 18th Street to be a parallel corridor. We're doing traffic calming on two more north-south corridors. But the really tricky one is still that eastern segment where we showed you we had to maintain two travel lanes to uh, meet our existing concurrency rules um, and preserve bus travel time. And so what we're looking at is actually doing an off-street multi-use path. So uh, the cyclists would basically get off the corridor at that point and come on to a sidewalk on, we haven't determined which side, and hopefully there'll be an expanded multi-use path. But it's really complicated there. Um, 
It's going to be really expensive. It's going to take right away. It's going to be a whole bunch of things. So we have um, created a capital project for it, and we have other mechanisms where we are exploring ways to build that. That is probably for another time. OK, lessons learned. We're going to take team this one. So first, um, asking the community being clear about what you want. So I wrote, define the values and desired outcomes. We wanted to be really clear with the community that we wanted to know their experiences, but we really cared about what their values were and what outcomes they wanted to see, rather than just telling us what type of facility design they wanted, right? We didn't want them to design the facility for us. We said, what do you want at the end of the day? Like, what is the outcome? Uh, so that when we come up with these different ideas, we have a clear set of values that were, um, you know, a clear evaluation criteria that we're using to determine what's best. Um, and then setting expectations about what we can and can't accomplish. Again, curb to curb, what can we do this year and next year versus in the next few years through our other programs or through other uh, larger capital projects. So kind of building on the first thing Kate said, asking the right questions, asking, going out to the community, your stakeholders, and saying, so do you want to remove this travel lane or not <laughs> is, is not the right question, right? You have to couch it in, in values and what you're trying to achieve and understanding the issues that people are telling you uh, they want to see addressed. Um, stories are key. Uh, I, there's a, there's a, a story that I heard at a neighborhood association meeting that left an indelible impression on me um, where we were talking about these safety statistics, which, you know, hundreds of crashes, which is very abstract when you're talking about it with, with, with folks. But a, a woman at a neighborhood association meeting talked about how she had seen someone get hit by a car and helped them. They weren't badly injured, thank God, but she helped them stand up and collect themselves and a whole bunch of people saw this happen on fourth plane. And all of a sudden the entire neighborhood association room there was like, they understood what the safety problem was on fourth plane that we were trying to address. Another really important thing when you're talking with stakeholders is be clear about what happens if we do nothing. We have this opportunity now, but what are the problems that are going to keep happening on this corridor if we don't do anything? And then finally, last slide, I promise. Um, lessons learned more on the kind of decision making and design side of things. Um, you know, complete streets are still a new concept um, for many. Not everyone at your agency or your consulting firm or wherever you work is necessarily on board with all of the underlying principles that go along with complete streets, right? But the key is to bring people along for the ride, right? And that's what kind of the bring the receipts on design decisions is about, is we found it very effective to talk about how a cycle track had been implemented elsewhere, how it was, uh, how this is an adopted um, practice, this isn't new, and that helped to move the conversation forward on some of these elements that, like, there are no cycle tracks in the city of Vancouver today, and there are no bicycle signals, and both of those are integrated into this project now. Um, another point on that is it doesn't always pay to be first. I think what we've heard, you know, we're working with the, bank, with the folks at Vancouver, they want to know where this has been done elsewhere and it's been successful. They're not necessarily looking to be on the front lines of testing a new idea. So being able to show where things have worked elsewhere is very important. And then the last thing, uh, as we all know, DOTs are our friend in this. We were working very closely with WashDOT uh, on some of this. And you know, WashDOT, ODOT, both have new, uh, newish, multimodal, um, you know, essentially mandates. And so your DOT partners are your friends uh, along this ride, especially if they own part of the facility you're working on. And with that, I think we'll end. Oh, I just want to make this plug because it's in really small writing, but we're doing a lot of really cool Complete Streets projects, and we're looking for a senior transportation planner to help manage them. So we're hiring. Talk to me if you're interested. Yeah. I feel like we've, we're already over time, but is there, are we, we're not over time? Good. Great. Hi. Um, I guess what do, you, what do you consider when, uh, like, taking the community into it or not taking the community into it? Because both of you kind of touched on, like, uh, outreach into the community and not, um, and like, I just kind of want you guys to define like what the process is in making that decision because 
uh, I guess the biggest complaint when I hear the community being taken into it is the longer, the like long length of the process that it takes because you have the outreach, but then you have the community saying, no, we want this, and plans change and designs change, and then it takes years and years and years to finish. So I guess like, what are your decisions when outreaching to the community? Yeah, well, this is new, and like I said, we're now looking at every single roadway on our paving list, and where we've sort of drawn the line is um, if it's, uh, the question is when to bring in the community on a process like this. Um, so for us, if the change we want to make is going to take a travel lane or repurpose a travel lane or repurpose parking, then generally we are going to engage the community on that because that's where they feel the most passionate. If it's a, a geometric change that's safety or if it's something like even turn pockets where it's like we just need to know the data works, then we probably won't because we want to just advance those and sort of move those um, as quickly as possible. And like that one example I said, we're taking a center turn lane because we looked and we're like, you know, the, the data is fine and people aren't going to be that upset about a turn lane. Um, there's not a lot of businesses and access. And so for us, it's the it's parking and repurposing travel lanes are when we need to engage the community. i just add real quick that the city has a, a large pipeline of complete streets projects coming up. Bringing the community along and making sure they understand and frankly are comfortable with what's happening is essential to the success of the program overall. If the community feels blindsided by what we're doing here, that jeopardizes everything else the city is trying to achieve. So. Yeah, not optional. <laughs> um, I think, you know, in terms of our presentation from City of Tigard, you know, we're more on the policy development end, and we had multiple open houses with the community, and, you know, I think just speaking to values is really important, whether it's a project or policy uh, that you're working on. And, you know, I mentioned our, our implementation plan had 20 specific actions. A lot of those came directly from conversations that we had from people, uh, with people in the community. Yeah, some things um, that were on that map that I didn't mention, but were like street murals and other placemaking components that came out of the process, again, that we're really going to be focused on highlighting the like multicultural businesses and community in the area. So we um, dealt with those by putting them into our project recommendations that will be not done with the paving, but will go into our other programs that the city has. Um, and yes, I forgot my second part of that. Um, I guess maybe just to add that, you know, a lot of that stuff is probably already codified somewhere. Um, but when you um, get to project development itself, there's probably quite a bit of flexibility. And that's, I think, that engagement with the community and nearby, you know, residents, neighbors, community members to, to learn what they're interested in. You can find some flexibility. I will mention that you, you mentioned managing the curb. So City of Tiger, I think somewhat tangentially related to our complete streets policy, we are developing a, a curbside management um, program or policy for the city, um, hopefully uh, starting this summer. Um, and that's gonna give us more direction. Uh, definitely a, a topic of interest, I think, for a lot of agencies right now. I don't know who is next. I think Robert might have been next. Oregon 217, one of the freeways that goes through Tiger. And, um, I know the ODOT's been working on adding a lane in either direction. I don't know a lot about that project or how exactly how it impacts Tiger, but it just raised a couple of questions from me with regard to your presentation. So one, I'm wondering if, if projects like that give you an opportunity, like if that's something you can leverage and, and get benefits through um, that project, maybe investing in some biking walking elements of your TSP in some way or mitigation, how kind of how that how that has worked. And then I'm also wondering is is there a way to through like travel forecasting to quantify how adding so much 
freeway lane capacity can kind of offset or counteract all of the improvements for the biking and walking infrastructure that you've been making on the local network? I guess I'll start with the second question first. I think, I mean, that's a big conversation that we're having in the Portland metro region right now. We have some of these big projects that are happening and, and there's not, I don't think there's agreement necessarily on some of the potential negative outcomes of some of these, these big projects. And Highway 217 is a good example. We're adding lane capacity to 217. What, what's the, you know, it's sure it's gonna reduce travel times or congestion for a while on that facility, but what's that going to do to you know connecting roads and, and those sorts of things? I don't have a good answer for you. I'm I'm sure that's a good that's a good project for somebody to take on. Um, and then first question, absolutely, like you have to have these projects identified early so that when other projects are happening, like the 217 project, that you know if we would have had some of our our new TSP had by crossings of 217 on the books prior to project development for the 217 project, it would have been a, a heck of a lot easier to get some of those built concurrently with that project. Now, you know, 217 is under construction. It's it's too late to do anything with, with that project. Um, and, and we do have some new crossings um, of 217 pet bike crossings that we're going to have to go find, you know, separate grant funding and do totally separate project development, project engineering, mobilization, you know, all that stuff, so. It is 317, but I feel like we can take a few more questions if folks want to filter out or do we need to stop? It was a, uh, we looked at the traffic analysis to understand what the heavier directions were, westbound or eastbound, to prioritize which side of the road to put those bus lanes in. So where we didn't have it on both sides of the road, sometimes we had it on the heavier trafficked westbound or the heavier traffic eastbound. Camilla? Yeah, so um, the Complete Streets policy within the implementation plan had a specific action that talked to this, and basically it, it established um, not really a process, but just said, hey, um, every year when we are looking at our pavement management program and what streets we're repaving, we're looking for complete streets opportunities. And we, we, we've we done that to a certain extent uh, prior to the policy being in place, but having the policy in place just sort of makes it a requirement and an expectation. So we review the plans and, and we look for those opportunities. And then also, just um, now that we have much more robust ped bike network plans, we have better direction on where we need to be looking um, instead of being sort of like piecemeal. Um, we, we know where we need to link up um, those connections. So not to air our dirty laundry, but I mean, this is something, the city of Vancouver, that we are really like churning out with our public works friends and our maintenance and we are like quarter of a quarter and we're also updating our TSP and part of that is creating these design guides like when are we using posts? When are we using tough, tough, you know, tough curbs? How far from a driveway before we can put delineators? And so we're spelling this out but the good news about the complete streets policy and our Transportation Mobility Commission and our city council is that they have given us a directive and we can point back to them and say they have told us we have to do this. So when an engineer tells me I can't narrow the lane because there's reflectivity requirements and people are going to drive on them and we can't do it, we say then we'll get you more maintenance staff so that you can go out there and restripe them more frequently because they've told us we have to do that. And you know that's the truth and thankfully we've been able to fall back on um, our elected and appointed people because they really want to see this done even if it's hard.
thinking about anti-gentrification or anti-displacement strategies as you're making these improvements? Um, and if areas are already feel financially inaccessible, are there ways you're thinking about bringing affordable housing um, back into these? Yeah, we um, recently, in the past few years, have done um, an equity index map that sort of catalogs, I wasn't involved in this, so I'm a little bit shaky, but catalogs sort of the, uh, the danger of displacement and increased value, and that's especially true on Fourth Plain. Um, and so a lot of work has gone into investing in that corridor, and right now we have about $30 million of American Rescue Plan dollars that we're investing in that corridor, and we're actually having a community-led budgeting process that's telling us how they want to spend that $30 million, and a lot of it is for affordable housing. Actually, this is a new affordable building unit called the Fourth Plain Commons. It's going to have um, community space, housing, uh, commissary, all sorts of cool stuff. And uh, the other thing I'll just say, as part of our TSP, we now are embedding all of our sort of investment and prioritization uh, through the lens of our equity index map. And so not only sort of the dollars invested in, but then what are all the like complementary actions we're gonna take to make sure that we're not causing displacement with that. And then as part of the performance measures, we're tracking what all of that is every year. So how many like projects are being done in this area? Like how many lane miles are being improved, et cetera, et cetera. Just really quickly, that's something that we, we embed in a lot of our land use planning work, and then our transportation sort of follows that or, or links with it. So, um, you know, in our, our high growth urbanizing areas like the Tiger Triangle, uh, Washington Square Regional Center, where we're seeing a lot of new affordable housing go in, and we're, we're looking at ways that the transportation system can support those new uh, projects and development. And just as an example, uh, I didn't mention it, but we're, we're updating our transportation impact analysis requirements for development, and we're trying to shift to person trips, um, getting away from vehicle trips. And that has a big impact on, on what we're able to require development to build. So requiring develop, development to build more like pedestrian crossings and, and sidewalk infrastructure, those sorts of things to support those kinds of developments. Yeah, Jenna, I think yeah, your hand was up. Last question. Last question. So the three to take rock has something embedded in this presentation that I felt like was a big deal, uh, or maybe I'm thinking a bit bigger, but you said that there was like a policy about going from three, five to three. Yeah. Like, that, that was just there. I'm like, what? Like, my, you know, and so like five to three. So then if you're, if the city has a policy in place to go from five to three, but you're trying to leverage the pavement projects, how do you stay ahead of those opportunities and do the engagement in the planning? Because you have to do parking utilization study, and you have to show cross-section and get community support, and how's that going to work? <laughs> well, just to, to, so to be clear, these were planned five-lane expansions of existing three-lane roads. Oh, still, that. still a pretty, that's still, it's a, I would challenge you, I would challenge you to find another city that's done that recently in the Portland metro region, um, downsizing future roads. Um, we, um, I, I did mention one roadway corridor that, that will be a road diet, um, but we're not there in project development yet. So. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Personalities came through. Yeah, totally. <laughs> That's good.